third party. Yeah. Bull moose. I mean, if, if I hate to use these words, but if it's not now, when When? would it ever be? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I, I have to say, I have always been someone who prides himself on independent thinking um, and thinking for myself. Um, The logic of polarization that has so deeply embedded itself in American politics. And there's a lot of reasons we can talk about why and how we got here. I would argue gerrymandering was part of the situation. I could argue there's a whole bunch of reasons where the primary became the biggest battle, not the actual general election, for causing people to go more left in left-leaning districts or more right in right-leaning districts, resulting in this massive polarization. But that process has created a totally empty middle ground and around the centrist logic, which I think makes it really ripe for a centrist, slightly progressive leaning, long-term focused, working in the national interest political party. Um, And I think there's a lot of appetite for it. I think there'd be a lot of people interested in, 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 in supporting that. And I think you could get a whole new revitalization of the talent that would come into politics, right? There are so many people I know, so many people I've talked to, really capable, accomplished individuals who we would want as Americans to be serving in office, and they would never consider it, given the dynamics of today. They say, well, if I ran as a Democrat, I have to go party line everything, or I'm going to be outcast by them. Or if I ran as a Republican, I'd have to be party line. I can't do that. And so there's no middle place for me to think for myself. And I think there should be a party that allows the conscience of the individual to come into play. Mm-hmm. Right? No, that I mean, crazy. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, politically speaking, I, I mean, I, I think the two most powerful people in America are Joe Manchin and Steve King. Uh, I mean, the independent and the moderate Democrat. I mean, it's, it's amazing that one person can say one thing in an interview and move the stock market. Yeah. And yet, yeah. That's yeah. what we that that's what that's what this has come down to. Yeah. Um, By the way, you can also imagine all sorts of interesting coalitions where you could pull out the centrist instinct among existing existing individuals there that would jump from existing parties over and you'd get a huge support base formed around the country of reasonable people that just want to put this behind them kind of dynamic. So um, I, I think that's. I think there's a real possibility of a third party emerging and have real success in the next five years. Yay! Hopefully they'll <laughs> be calling you and not me because there's that mindset. Um, <laughs> yep. There you go. So every once in a while, if I need amusement, I will unmute my bubble vision so that I can hear the latest commercial real estate person say that urbanization is going to come back and come back strong and come back quick. Uh, I, mean, look, I mean, if you think about zero interest rate policy, and this isn't even just a United States phenomenon, it's global. I mean, what do you do in a zero interest rate environment? You build, you build up. So we have these massive multifamily high rises, we have more offices, we have more luxury hotels. Yeah. And yet, you know, again, I turn off the mute on bubble vision to hear them say, it's all going to come back and stronger. You would dispute that. I would, you know, so my view on this here is that COVID was an accelerant. Uh, This was fuel on existing fires, so to say. And what I mean by that is we had, pardon the medical pun, many pre-existing conditions. And one of the pre-existing conditions we had was a greater utilization of existing, uh, existing capacities, right? So it was, okay, you have a home, but you know what? you maybe are traveling and so why not monetize the empty home rather than let people go to a hotel? And so we got Airbnb, uh, sharing economy. Or you know what, you got this office space, but you know what, Danielle, you travel all the time. Hey, you know what, I'm coming to Dallas for a day. I need an office. You might not even use your office. Fine, Vikram, pay me 50 bucks, leave it on the counter, be good to go. I'll pay the cleaning, fine, great. And so you get co-working. Or, you know, hey, we got all these cars out there and you get Uber or Lyft or what have you. And so what I think you've seen is that co-working specifically was getting a real tailwind. And now the work from home phenomenon is taking that a pre-existing condition and accelerating it. And so, you know, I've talked to many Fortune 500 uh, CEOs and their boards. One really large company has 30 million square feet of space around the world. 
has said they're going to reduce their real estate footprint by 25% in the next five years. This is a Fortune 500 company. This is a multi tens and tens of billions of dollars and thousands of employees and across hundreds of countries kind of thing. They're going to reduce their real estate footprint by 25%. Because they found that, hey, you can actually work remotely. Hey, we don't need everyone to go into the headquarters every day. We can have three days, one day of overlap. We can have surge capacity for the days where we have, but we don't need this much space. And you're right, because of the overbuilding, that's the supply side. Take the demand side, take the demand side down. The supply side's gone up. And what do you got? You got a recipe for some real headwinds when it comes to real estate. At least in the in the office real estate specifically. I mean, there may be other dynamics at work in other. Well, sectors. I always when when I speak of office, urban, I always speak of urban multifamily in the same sentence because one was built to support you know to support the other.